Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. And as Matt said, I'm actually an instructor at University of Arizona and also teach online at University of Kentucky and University of Tennessee. So it's a little bit different format with the projects that you're doing and it seems like you're very focused on what you would like to accomplish today. So first I want to tell you, marketing is not painful. It's a lot of fun. Hopefully this will be the, the good part of the, the day here, what's going on. And normally when I do a full-on marketing uh, lecture and workshop, you know, we get into all the different piece of it, pieces of it. This is what's called the marketing loop, you know, where you determine who your customers are, their behaviors, what they need and want, develop products and services. And can, oh, can you hear me okay? I have a hand back there. Um, so again, the first two, two boxes, my guess is, is that something you guys have already done um, during in, when you were here earlier in March and coming up with the projects that you have. And so right now you're then moving into the stage about informing customers about these great products, services, programs that you're developing. And in some ways marketing has gotten extremely sophisticated and this can be very scary for libraries or nonprofit organizations when we don't have a huge marketing budget. You don't have five uh, full-time uh, marketing scientists, if you will, doing this. And this is a screenshot just to give you a little bit of idea of how this is working now, sometimes more in the corporate world. Um, this is a basketball game down in Phoenix. And what you see is the Verizon data, Verizon cell phone users are in here, and they're reporting data back to the stadium that reports it to other marketing companies that puts together various demographics, how you're using your credit card, how you're spending. So for example, just in a quick snapshot, they can tell 22% of the people who went to this game um, we're from out of town. We can tell by your, your, where your bill is from with the Verizon. Um, the spectators tend to be parents, have children, um, their income levels are above 50,000, a mix of ages between 25 to 54. 13% of the people at this game also attended a spring training game. And 8.4% was the average increase in traffic at a food chain within 24 hours of somebody seeing an ad at this game. So as you can tell, that's one level of marketing where it's just sort of the big brother-ish things going on. But before you think, oh no, big brother, a good thing that comes from this is a level of sophistication that messages are delivered to you, the consumer. You're not having to have um, spam mailing or junk mail because now marketers have gotten very sophisticated in what they can send to you to deliver to you. And as a result, most of us have come to like that. We don't, want, we don't want junk coming our way. So hold that thought there. The other side of marketing, in fact, I'm, I'm going to show you a quick video here. And this, again, is to help you get in the mindset of the people you're going to be sending your message to. Can you see okay or I can lower the lights?
So I'm hoping by now you're capturing the awe and power <laughs> of some of these social media sites, the changes that are happening, uh, the people that will be your audience for the message here. So again, just to give you that, that big picture view, because a lot of things we're going to be talking about is how to harness or tap into some of these statistics and data that you just saw. Um, so we talked big scale marketing, and then in other ways, marketing has become very personalized. And I, and I love this little infographic here. Uh, for those of you, probably most of you are pretty familiar with the social media sites, but to describe it, you know, Twitter is, I'm drinking coffee. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm good at drinking coffee. YouTube, watch me as I drink coffee, and then uh, Instagram, I'm 13, I drink coffee, and I'm taking pictures of myself. So it's a very me-centered, um, not society necessarily, but the way we interact sometimes with these technologies. And again, from a marketer standpoint, that's very important to keep in mind. Also, we're hyper-connected, overly occupied, we multitask, we photo, we take pictures, we post, we do all these kind of things going on. That's a mindset of your audience you're going to be working with. In fact, now they say curating the exhibition of the self has become a 24-7 occupation. And that's a lot of data that we're not only taking in from others, but again, data that we're creating, adding ourselves. Um, we're a, a point and no instant uh, information gratification society now. It's all at our fingertips. And marketing has become much more about a two-way conversation, not just the push, here's a message I want you to know, but it's a, a push-pull conversation. And then also, tell us what we're awful at. Tell us what we can improve. The projects that you're doing, they don't come necessarily out of the box perfect. It's going to take that multi-conversation uh, with, with your target audience. So here's an example of um, Domino's Pizza that had the Twitter campaign where people could take pictures of the pizza, post it. They had a live feed in uh, New York City, and they call it Flossom version of marketing. We're awesome because we're flawed. So again, people are forgiving of that. They're acceptable. As long as they can be part of the conversation saying what needs to be fixed, what needs to be added, what do they need. So that two-way conversation. Is that better? OK. Um, we're also seeing a lot more creative approaches to information delivery. So imagine trying to learn Mandarin. Whoops. Uh, so there's the Mango way, if you have Mango databases that you used before. And now they also have the sexy Mandarin. So it's the gals in these little outfits teaching you how to speak. So it's just a different way of delivering the content to attract an audience. Doesn't work for everyone or everywhere, but companies are stepping outside of the box to say, how do we get somebody's attention that we couldn't get before? And this is probably the, the number one message so far is we're in an attention economy. And human attention is now the scare re scarce resource we all compete for. Um, so you, that's the first thing to have in your mind as you're developing your projects, you're going to get the word out, is it's an uphill battle. Um, and then the question becomes, how do you take everything good that you're doing, here's sort of a list of your projects, to get it to the tipping point, to where you have that momentum, where word can get out there, good things can start to happen. And a lot of libraries, I've noticed, uh, do what I call the hope marketing, 
which is a little bit like you throw the spaghetti in the wall and you hope it works. I hope if I do this flyer, it's going to happen. I hope this, this, you know, people show up for this event or this program. So I wanted to demonstrate to you firsthand what hope marketing can look like. So for example, what if I were to say to you, hey guys, I've got a marketing expert. Um, they've got 20 years experience. They know library services. They're passionate about it. And if you want, I can put them on your team as a consultant. No charge. They're going to donate your time. How many of you guys would want this person showing up and being on your team? Raise a hand. OK, so um, that's kind of what happened when, as Matt said, on June 3rd, I sent you guys an email saying, hey, going to be here. Tell me what you're doing. What's going on? Tell me about your projects. Because quite honestly, you know, I had talked to Robert Shoup. Thank you. He's the one who actually had given Matt my name. And I talked to Matt. I had a little vague understanding about what I lead was about. But me as an instructor, you know, I'm used to my university gig or what's going on. So I'm thinking, hmm, as a marketer, I better make sure I can hopefully deliver what you guys are interested in. So let me, let me try and get this. But didn't use a very good marketing approach because when you guys got the email, what you heard was, blah, 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 blah. Oh my gosh, I'm so busy. I'm getting ready for I'm a week out of the office. I have to get to do this. I can't do that. You know, it's a lot on your plate right now. That, that's the video we just watched. That is you and your lives. You have families, you have vacations, you have things going on. So this email drops in your box. It's not very well delivered. It's just a lot of blah, blah, yeah, whatever. We show up, she'll be there. We're going to get it, not to worry. So one person responded, where's Laura Lee? Hey, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Woo! No, and, but that said, the problem wasn't on your side. The problem was on my side as a deliverer of the message, as the marketer. So imagine I got a 3% response rate. So when you send out and you hope you're going to send a thing and you're going to get some kind of response, that's what happens. And that's what happens to a lot of library marketing campaigns. My message was, wasn't compelling enough to get your attention. Your time is a very scarce resource. Um, so in that case, it's a marketer's downfall. You know, I didn't know about enough about the program kind of fishing for ideas. And luckily, though, from what Matt sent me, I was able to figure out, ah, this is what you guys are doing. Because otherwise, it would have been a very different presentation. Um, so. Well, we both Matt already. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was from Matt. That's right. <laughs> Forget that. So, um, so today's work is going to be what I call traction marketing. And it's the little things you can do to start making big differences, you know, that investment of time and resources to, to make a difference in trying to get that word out. And there's uh, five steps to this whole thing, to narrow your focus, find linchpins, build audience, share, deliver. So kind of go on here. So the first is the reality, not everybody in the state of Utah is going to be your audience. Oftentimes when we ask somebody, who's this project for? Well, it's for the seniors. It's for kids. It's multi-generational. They're going to love it. And that could be true down the road, but when you're starting with your marketing, you really, really need to narrow down you know, one audience. And usually the, the way to figure that out is who's got the most to gain? Who is really going to care? Because what you're trying to do is build champions in the community. If you can get people on board, um, whether it's, I think it's Creative Utah as a website where people can add content, you know, if you can start to get people engaged and involved, it's going to build from there. Um, and it's okay to start with small chunks and then build up that momentum. So one of the things when we get through with this, you're going to have time uh, to go through this exercise yourself. And so instead of thinking everybody's your audience, just pick one. And, and you might eventually have 10, 20, 30 audiences. But as from a marketing perspective, you need to have success with something and somewhere first to build on. Um, and so that's why we, the first part is that narrow your focus. Um, in fact, Laura Lee had sent something. She says, accessible tutorials for Utah patrons and libraries. And she sent me in her email, I'm qu quoting you here, Laura Lee, you know, it's, it's about this. We've got videos for patrons um, to how to work with patrons with impairments. So then I wrote back to her and said, well, just to clarify, are the tutorials being designed to show to library staff on how uh, for them to work with patrons with impairments? Or are the tutorials designed for patrons with impairments to show them about uh, using library services? And she wrote back both, which is probably, again, very true. But you got to start somewhere. Who's going to be your champion? Is it going to be 
uh, librarians pushing this or are you going directly to the end user? And if you're going to the end user, you can pick out a smaller audience first. And some things, again, they're, 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 they're simultaneous, but that's usually where we, we're limited in our energy and our downfall comes as we try and spread ourselves too thin instead of getting success with one group or the other. Um, and some possible ways, and this I just, because she did email me, <laughs> put some of the different ideas, and these may be things you've already considered. Um, focus on specific age group with disability. I think in one of your videos, it had a librarian talking about working uh, in a story time, and she had a child with autism, and it was a very different experience because she initially thought the child was misbehaving and not realizing, wait, this is going on, and then come to find out, there's a lot of parents with children with autism that are very frustrated with library services because of traditional story time does not meet their needs. So this could be a really great first audience is working out, working with parents and caregivers, specifically story times or something libraries are strong with. And if you can build a following with this group and you get libraries to start creating programs that meet their needs or resources, then this group leads to another, to another, to another. So again, just sort of at the limited look at your material. Um, the other one, of course, is partnering with other groups that are already doing this and doing it well. How can you grab under their coattails? Um, and this doesn't necessarily always have to be government agencies, like I listed a few here, like National Services for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. But there's also other sites like Audioboo. Um, that's a social networking one for uh, people with disabilities, teaching them how to use different uh, social media. So, so don't just limit your scope to a partnership with government. You know, think outside the box. Or you could do focus groups with people with disabilities to find out how do they get their information, how can you relate to them. Another sort of maybe way to narrow is working with local schools or on the staff that work with visually or hearing impaired students. Um, or most university office, universities have an office um, of disability services. So right here you can see there's 10 different directions you can go in. But again, start with one and then build out from there. The next big thing is finding your linchpins. And these are people that are connectors that have the power to take your idea and push it out to a lot of different people. Um, they tend to have a large sphere of influence. And that's not necessarily because they're in a position of um, high authority. Let's say, you know, Robert's the, the director of a library. But it could be somebody who's a page but that is just jamming on social media. You know, that can be just as a valuable linchpin. Um, again, they have the ability to spread the others to others who can spread the word. So I'm gonna give you an example of this um, we had in Scottsdale. So this is Kim Hanna. She works for our Economic Development Office. And so one day, Kim was at a meeting and she said, this is all the city leaders, hey, we're working with Arizona State University on a program called Furnace, where entrepreneurs can come together, pitch their ideas, great things can happen. And there was more to it than that. Well then, for me as a librarian thinking, I call it the slow hunch, where you hear something, and you're starting to just grasp and formulate. I could tell there was something cool about what she was saying, but in our library, we weren't really serving entrepreneurs, or it was just kind of that cool thing that we wish we were more involved with, like co-working spaces and so forth. So just on this hunch, I went on to LinkedIn and I, I Googled the whole furnace program and saw this guy's name, Gordon McConnell. And turns out he was the assistant VP for the Center for Innovation at ASU. And my message just said, hey, Gordon, I work with Kim at the city. Furnace looks like an amazing program and we're following the process to see if there's a way the library can be a resource for project teams. Again, that's a little bit of spaghetti marketing, but I'm like, this is cool, but how do we get to be a part of it? Then he writes back, he goes, hi, Dana, what a weird coincidence. I have been working on an idea, which I've shared with no one, about how to link with libraries. I would love to talk with you about it. Can you email me? OK, so that one little email on LinkedIn, because I heard from a linchpin, Kim, turned into this huge, massive partnership called uh, Eureka, which is like a center for innovations that Scottsdale is now piloting. It's the first um, kind of entrepreneurial space. And what ASU is delivering content uh, to entrepreneurs in the field. You no longer have to necessarily be at, on campus or what have you. Um, because what we're finding in a community, the economic health and vitality is huge. It's a very competitive process. So Scott still said, you know, we're up against Silicon Valley. We're up against Austin. How do we make sure our economy is recovering quickly and vibrant and the library can play a role in that? 
So again, this just gives you an example of a linchpin connecting to a linchpin who also connected. And now this program is piloted here, but they're starting to roll it out in California, in Texas, and it, it just that little ripple effect of one little thing that can lead to another. Now she's chatting back there, but I have to put her on the spot. I, we've got a linchpin in the room. There's Adrian. I don't know how many of you know Adrian Mores. And to me, this is a classic example of a linchpin. Um, she's a manager of a, a library here in Utah. She's also the director of the Emporia State University uh, School of Library and Information Management in the Utah region and the chair of the Mountain Plains Association Leadership Institute. So imagine her reach, her sphere of influence, just informally because of the people she knows, her willingness to share. If she gets excited about something she hears today or sees today, all she has to do is tell three people because the people she knows tend to be communicators and they're gonna tell three people and they're gonna tell three people. So finding more Adrians, that's the key, the linchpin. They're not, you know, the, the real, the, initially the, the famous movie stars out there, but it can be the people sitting right next to you, somebody at your table. Is, odds are there's a linchpin in here, or, or quite a few of them actually. So just the fact you're selected for the iLeague program leads me to believe I've got a room of linchpins. <laughs> so, but tapping into that. Okay, so you, you kind of narrow your focus, you figure out who your linchpins are going to be, and think of them as like power charge champions as well. Now the key is to build your audience. Um, because social media, it doesn't matter if it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, it needs the power of the crowd. So it's hard to spread the word, I said, when you have three friends. And this is something, now I'm gonna give you an example from MPLA, that's the Mountain Plains Library Association. So uh, that I was president, I think it was year, let's say 2009 or 10, right around in there. And we had this realization, um, we're made up of 12 different states, that even though we got together once a year in person for conferences, truly we were a virtual organization. So we went about how do we start to build that dynamic, build the audience. We were in a very similar situation you are now. We have a great product with our association. It was underutilized, we wanted to get the word out. So I'm showing you here, um, right now there's 800 likes, I think as of yesterday on this page. Those were hard won likes because I remember distinctly back in Montana, we were at a brewery and we had maybe about 150 likes on our Facebook page at this uh, MPLA conference in Montana and we thought, how do we get people to engage with us, get to know us? And that was a huge effort at the conference is talking face to face, hey like us, hey tell your friends to like us. I remember the day we got number 300 because a librarian had a daughter who had a friend who would get on there. And again, sometimes it's just that synergy, not all 800 people are truly passionate about MPLA, but we're now on their radar and oftentimes we get off links and we can gauge our statistics of who's watching us, who's using us, who's sharing us, who's spreading it. So once you can get that crowd build, um, that's where you really start to get the momentum. Oops, let's see here. Um, in our case, we did specific marketing just to build a crowd. Um, and this idea came from actually a commercial entity. One of the movie theaters in Arizona had a, a campaign at holidays and it said, give the gift of like. For every new like on the Harkins Movie Theater Facebook page, they donated 50 cents to Children's Hospital. So imagine, it's like um, social entrepreneurship. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll like you because I, I care about the hospital, I want the money. So we thought, hmm, how do we do that for MPLA? And we were able to get um, BWI, the book vendor that is now Baker and Taylor, uh, to be one of our sponsors. And they actually donated a dollar towards the MPLA professional development grant for every new like that we got during a certain amount of time. So again, it's a, it's a tandem marketing campaign. It wasn't really direct to our product, but knowing we had to get bulk and volume. Then we also started to run different contests on our Facebook page, like a, a brag away to play away contest where you could brag about your coworkers or cool things you were doing and, and uh, BWI would donate products back to the library. But again, that got people posting their stories on our site. We made huge efforts to go out and post on other people's sites because it's, again, not just about us, but what kind of information can we share? So one piece of information here might have also gone on 50 other related sites, whether it was other state associations, interest groups, that kind of thing. So it's a really a lot about that information management. But what's so nice now with these you know, consoles or things like Hootsuite, it's very easy to manage. It's low or no cost except for time investment. 
great interim project, you know. So, so this type of thing, it's easy to, to build on, and once you get that momentum, it keeps building, building faster, faster. Um, the next part is to share your message wisely. And now, who's the group that does the Utah Creative Libraries? Very cool, I love this. Now, and this was this something you guys did last March? Okay, and it was it sort of a, a practice of a promotion type video, or tell me a little bit about this. Okay. Okay. And I have to say, you know, very cool um, animations and message. I like the Speedo comment. Who wrote that line? <laughs> Admit it. Yes. Because <laughs> that, that's the kind of line that could go viral, definitely. Very good. Um, so, but I want to jump you back over to the whole first message. You know, human attention is a scarce resource. 127 people have given you five minutes and seven seconds of their attention. What what difference did, have they made towards your project? So I'm assuming people in the group watched it, your friends and family watched it, I watched it twice. Um, you know, so, so the thing is to keep in mind, it's, 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 a, it's a good video, but as a marketing arm, it's more um, you-centered versus your audience-centered, meaning the takeaway is, hey, collaboration's good, we need to share we're going to be using Creative Commons license. It's a win-win for everyone. That's kind of the key points of the message. Come in and, and play with us, right? But it's five minutes to get to go through that, but in, in a fun, playful way. So then, as a as a regular consumer, I start to go, yeah, I like this concept. This is really good. I, I like the idea of share, share. Best practices, get it out there. And I think, you know, this is like other sites that I'm used to doing this on. You know, Goodreads. I can create my stuff and share it. Um, they're shareable, not net. Um, and and again the society or culture of sharing is very prevalent out there. And this one, for example, you can have a, a post by a librarian or, or somebody off the street, you know, here's a great reading list. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the, maybe if we have time at the end, the whole domino chain at Seattle Public, somebody shared that. So this particular site, it's not exactly what you're doing, but basically people can share unique original content, share cool things they saw. They have about 22,000 fo followers. And what really works on a sharing site like this is if you like the person sharing, they have an RSS feed so I can follow what they want to do. I can retweet it easily. I can share it on Facebook. Um, I can see related articles, that kind of thing. So again, for you as a marketing perspective, sometimes looking at a commercial, this happens to be a, not a commercial one, but you could say a commercial example to say, what is it they're doing right? How are they attracting an audience? What's making it fun? And it can be hard if we don't have highly paid web designers on our team. But again, a lot of these tools now, between blogs or this and that, there's not that much behind the scenes engineering, but it's more the concept of what's right for the people who are going to be using your website, sharing their content. So what happens is, and it was shareable by the way, hey, I like this gig, how do I get involved, how do I share? It's easy, they show me how, instant sharing gratification, you know how it is, we like to drive, I like to post, I like to see my posts the second after I post it because then maybe I can share it on Facebook and somebody will like that I liked my post and I like the feedback because somebody might comment on it. So it's the whole thing is just instant and very gratifying as a sharer of content. It's that Facebook, instead of Pavlov conditioning, it's the Facebook conditioning. Okay, so now we're gonna jump over to the Creative Libraries Utah. And this is where we get to the part of, I call the deliver, deliver, deliver. Whatever it is you're gonna be marketing, you have to know the audience to say, are we going to meet their expectations? I promised you this really good thing, you know, a great way we're going to all get together and share what's going to happen when they get there. So that's why sometimes starting your marketing efforts small with a, with a unique group can be okay because you market, you get feedback, you tweak, you adjust, you market bigger, tweak, feedback, adjust, market bigger, market bigger. And meanwhile, always adjusting your project. Um, so on this site, this is your site, I know it's just still in development or things like that, that's totally fine, um, but you have to understand, you know, what is the user experience going to be on both the content contributor side and the consumer side? And what's going to happen on this site to create that feeding, consuming frenzy? Because it's got to be magic, it's got to be interesting and things going on. Because right now, and I know you're still in pilot stage, but it says, please send all uniquely created library content to this email. Okay, if I'm a content producer, I send it off into Ethosphere, and I'm watching the screen, and I'm watching the screen, 
When's my brilliance going to show up? Is it show up now, next week? And the reason I'm saying this is when you go on LinkedIn, a lot of people like to create groups, and they get very ambitious. And there's a lot of library groups that have created groups. And if you want to join the group, they've set it where you have to get the you know, permission, acceptance. Only the problem is they never had somebody monitoring it to hit accept, so you never get into the group. And then you think, I really don't want to be part of that group because there's nothing going on. So the key would be is if that's going to be how you have to do it te technology-wise, is somebody better be checking that email and posting within you know, twice a day, three times a day, or set up some kind of mechanism like as a blog, a built-in blog or something where it can immediately post. Because if you're a content producer, you're in the moment. You, know, you want to get it out there, get going. Um, and same thing, if I'm a consumer and I see something I love, I want to share. And that's your best marketer, somebody who gets excited right then and wants to tell 10 of their friends. And I think I did notice you do have, um, maybe this is on the story time link here, uh, yeah, a, a way to Facebook. You've added those widgets in, which is a really good thing. But I, th I think for all of us looking at projects, knowing what it's like on both ends, contributing, sharing, feedback, that whole loop that goes around. Um, in the case of your project in particular, think about how do you build a strong starting inventory, even while it's in development, because they're going to give you probably one, maybe two shots. You go out, you market, they're going to check it out. If what they see is lame or there's not content that interests them, they may not be back for a very long time, or they may tell their friends, don't waste your time. Um, and that's why, kind of going back to start small, if people know they're part of like the flossom early developmental phase, they can tell you, hey, this is really good, but have you thought about adding more of this content? Have you thought about tweaking your project this way? So having that two-way type thing. Um, so before all the bells and whistles go out, know, okay, it's really about um, th th that whole loop. And that's kind of those last two sections of deliver it out. It can be small, get the feedback, recreate, re-deliver it out, kind of keep it going in that loop. Um, so, because I, I did notice, I think there's maybe a couple story time posts right now. And, and I do think conceptually, that's a great idea. You know, this library profession is very much about sharing and best practices. So if you can get linchpins, and I'll go back to Adrian, I think you said you have two cohorts of 20 students each. Imagine getting those 40 students passionate about anything you guys are doing. They're going to be huge advocates. They're going to take it forward to their fellow students, to any job that they work in, that kind of thing. And she's got a fresh crop of students every year. So how do you put that on your marketing radar? You know, tap into this, tap in with the instructors. Sorry. <laughs> you know, but, but the key, I mean, that's just one example. There's a lot of different examples out there or groups that can work for you on your behalf. OK, so now I'm going to give you some time um, to sort of take just these first three ones about, you know, you've been doing your projects. But if you were to walk away today saying, here's the one you know, focus, the target audience we're going to start with first, who are a couple linchpins that you know could be your champions, um, that they may not even know it yet that they're going to be your champions, and then how could you start to build some of that bulk of audience? Um, and then one thing, I don't know if you guys are doing this, or for, again, I'm not totally familiar with all your projects, but to cross market. So for example, the best of on the accessibility tutorials can they end up on your site? And yeah, so all you know, th those kind of good things happening, because you're almost within this group, your own best source of information and, and cross promotion, that kind of thing. OK, so any questions before I kind of have you go with your teams? And what I'll do is kind of go around um, you know, and sit with you if you have specific questions or ideas. I do have my email here and my phone, and I'm always happy to answer questions. So I, like I said, on the, the whole email, I was just getting around with you guys. but. You know, again, I just wanted to show you that as an example of, um, of the, ho the hope type thing. But always feel free to, you know, follow up with me, you know, contact. So any questions before we do the, the breakout portion?